<laughs> okay, let's start class. Uh, in previous class, we have <coughs> learned about the nucleation. And from this class, I will talk about more detail about the uh, ion carbon and other alloy system. Uh, at start, I will briefly introduce the basics, some basics of ion carbon system and the, the role of alloy element which we utilize in making alloy in the ferrous uh, system. And I will continue the theoretical analysis of the diffusional growth at first in binary system. Binary means ion carbon. And then we'll, we will move to the growth kinetics in the ternary system, which, in which we will consider the effect of the alloying element on the uh, growth <coughs> kinetics of, in particular, the protectoid ferrite. And it will, it will take uh, three or four classes to complete whole things on the diffusion growth of the ferrite. This is well known, the ion carbon paste diagram. You, you, I, I hope you are familiar with it, don't you? So as you can see in this phase diagram, there is only four phase liquid, austenite, and ferrite, and cementite. Actually, this phase diagram is not, strictly speaking, is not the equilibrium diagram. Why? Yeah, it is partly related with it, but more accurate one is that the cementite. Actually, the equilibrium state of carbon is not the cementite, it's graphite. But in actual case, even with very slow cooling rate, it is very difficult for us to observe the graphite in ion carbon system. Instead of graphite, we usually absorb the cementite, which is a compound, ion compound with carbon. When you look at this page diagram, there are four important temperatures, which is called AE1 and AE3 and I forgot, A, A4, A maybe. Okay, AE4 and ACM. AE1 temperature is the temperature where the eutectoid reaction occurs. And AE3 temperatures is where the ferrite completely transforms to austenite. And AE4 temperatures is where the delta ferrite start to form when we increase the temperatures. And AECM temperature is where the cementite is completely dissolved into austenite in high per eutectoid steel. Here, AE, here, AE1, AE3, AE4, AECM. E means equilibrium. The temperature you can find in equilibrium page diagram. Sometimes you can see the terminology like AR1, AC1, and also AR3, AC3. What is the difference between the AE1 and AR1 and AC1?
as I mentioned, AE1 is the temperature you can see and the page diagram. And AR1, <coughs> yeah, AR1 is that the temperature you can observe during cooling. AC1 is the temperature you can observe during heating. So usually, usually AR1 So why we use the subscript C instead of H, for example, heating or raising? You know that that character comes from the French. In French, Heating is suffers. I'm not good at in French, but in French this means heating. So the C comes from here. And also the R is some word, some word starts with R. <laughs> Refrodissimum. Oh, it's quite difficult. Anyone who are familiar with uh, French? Is it correct? Yeah. <clears throat> and one more thing is that you can see in this page diagram, you will not find the phase such as bainite or martensite because bainite and martensite is metastable phase, so it did not appear in the equilibrium phase diagram. So I will have a chance to talk about the transformation mechanism, which is displacive or shear transformation mechanism in the later part of this class, I briefly say that when we quench, quench means cool very rapid speed, rapidly from the austenization temperature to the room temperatures, then you can observe this kind of microstructure depending on the chemical composition. So when you fastly cool the austenite, then there is not sufficient time for carbon or other alloying element to diffuse to make uh, equilibrium phase such as ferrite or cementite. So they tend to freeze to make a supersaturated carbon solution. And the matrix should be transformed to BCC-like structures by displacive transformation mechanism, which is similar to the deformation, some kind of deformation. So you have to remember that this phase is metastable phase, so it uh, does not appear in the equilibrium phase diagram. And the details, we will have a chance to talk about it. <clears throat> so, in usual case, it is very rare event to use uh, ion carbon alloy system in the engineering purpose. Instead of the, those kind of binary system, we use lots of alloy element like mangan, carbon, chromium, and many other things. Even though we use those kind of alloying element, the 
purpose of the alloying can be categorized in these three three items. The most important thing is most important purpose to put the alloy element in the ferrous system is that to obtain the higher strength or toughness. In other words, to improve its mechanical properties. So in terms of solid solution, precipitation hardening, or even the changing the fracture mode, which is beneficial in application at lower temperature. In other, pur other purpose to adding the alloy element is to control the austenite to other transformation products such as ferrite or martensite or even in bainite. So for that purpose, we add some hardenability, some elements to increase the hardenability. For example, manganese, chromium, or other elements, molybdenum and boron. Those kind of elements can be added to the uh, as a alloying element to changes the transformation characteristics from the austenite to lower uh, temperature transformation product. You have to remember that even in one alloys, uh, one uh, alloys like manganese, it can have many other purpose. For example, mangan can be added to the uh, Mangan can be added as a alloying element to increase the strength by solid solution. But it also can be added to the steel to increase the hardenability. So you have to remember, even in single alloying element, it has many purpose. Finally, some alloying element is added to the steel to get some interesting, some uh, specific function. For example, it is well known that nickel or chromium, in particular chromium, added to the stainless steel to increase the corrosion resistance. And in some alloy element added to prevent high temperature oxidation. And to get some specific thermal expansion. What is the representative <coughs> alloy system, which in particular is interested in thermal expansion? Sorry? Yeah, actually, every nickel system in bar, which is called in bar, iron 30 36% nickel system has very, very stable thermal expansion characteristics. It means that when you increase the temperature, the thermal expansion is almost zero. You may heard about the Invar alloy. Here is the typical element used in the ferrous alloy, which is categorized as a carbide former. Here, that is the solid solution strengthening element. And this solid circle is the element for use, for uh, element for control, the austenite to ferrite or Bainite martensite transformation kinetics. <coughs> and here, the calcium and lanthanum and cerium is put to the, put to the uh, iron alloys to control the morphology of the inclusion. For example, when you, when you still have a manganese sulfide, it is very ductile phase. So it is easily 
deformed during the hot rolling. Those kind of elongated manganese sulfide is very weak position for the initiation of the cracking. So you have to make them better round shape. To make manganese sulfide to maintain its round shape during the hot rolling, those kind of cerium or calcium is added to the steel. So that is the meaning of the uh, control of the inclusion. Here, this sixth element is carbide forming element. So carbide forming means when you put this kind of alloying element into the steel, it combine, it tend to combine with the carbon. So what is the effect of those kind of carbide forming element? Strengthening. That is the only thing you know about <laughs> precipitation, sensitization. OK, before talking about the effect of the precipitation, I will talk about uh, those kind of alloying elements <coughs> on the stability of phase. Roughly speaking, the alloying element can be categorized in two whether it stabilize austenite or whether it stabilize ferrite. It is very easy to see whether those kind of element is ferrite stabilizer or the austenite stabilizer. When you look at the phase diagram, when you increase the content of all the element, then look at the range of the temperatures where the austenite or ferrite is stable. For example, when you look at nickel or nickel manganese cobalt, carbon, nitrogen, copper, zinc, when you put those kind of alone element, the temperature region where the austenite is stable tend to extend, right? And you put the alloy element, the temperature region where the austenite stable is increased. So you can easily imagine that that kind of alloy element can be categorized as austenite stabilizer. On the contrary, when you put silicon, aluminum, phosphorus, and other things here, it, when you put those kind of alloy element into steel, it decreases the temperature range where the austenite is stable. In other words, it increases the equilibrium region of the ferrite. So you can easily imagine that those kind of alloy element is ferrite stabilizer. And one thing you have to remember is that when, if one alloy element, certain alloy element is austenite stabilizer, then it tend to enrich into austenite where, when the two phase, austenite and ferrite, is in the equilibrium state. It is natural when you look at the phase diagram, in particular two-phase region. This is not that good example. You can see this region is two-phase region where the ferrite and austenite coexist. So when you look at the equilibrium concentration of the alloying element in this tie line, you can see that the equilibrium concentration alloying element of nickel is higher than that in ferrite. 
So the other element which stabilize austenite tend to enrich into austenite. And in other words, the other element which stabilize ferrite tend to enrich in ferrite. Here, here this outer uh, area, outer region is all ferrite stable region. And here, inside of this crescent-like shape is austenite stable region. So when you look at the tie line in two-page region, the concentration of the alloying element, like <coughs> silicon or aluminum, is higher in ferrite. Okay. It depends on the alloying element. So there is no uh, convincing rule mm -hmm. where uh, which alloying element is more strong effect on the page diagram. So you have to calculate or you have to look at. Okay, let's talk about the carbide former. As I told you, there in among the alloying elements, chromium, titanium, vanadium, niobium, tungsten, and which one? One more there is. Niobium. Okay. Those six alloying elements tend to form the carbide in a uh, ferrous alloy. So when austenite decompose into ferrite and carbide, those kind of alloy elements, nickel, copper, silicon, phosphorus, usually do not form or carbide or nitride. But the alloy element, molybdenum, vanadium, titanium, tungsten, niobium, tend to form a alloy compound with carbon. Of course, they can exist in ferrite matrix as a solid solution in part, but some part of the uh, alloying element can form the, the carbide during the austenite decomposition. And as you can see in this uh, <coughs> formation enthalpy of various carbide, here the formation enthalpy of the cementite, and you can see all of the alloy carbide has lower formation enthalpy than the cementite, which means it is more stable than iron carbide. Alloy carbide, usually the alloy carbide is more stable than the iron carbide. So sometimes it can take the carbon from cementite. At first, the carbon was with iron, to form a cementite, but when you put some alloying element, it can take the carbon from the cementite. The well-known phenomena which alloying element, when the alloying element taking the carbon from the cementite, is a secondary hardening. Secondary hardening means when you quench the alloy, uh, ferrous alloy from the austenite to obtain the martensite, then the hardness will be drastically increased because that is the property of the martensite. But when, the, when you get the martensite, it is very brittle even though its strength is very high. So sometimes you have to make, you have to do another 
heat treatment to obtain the toughness, which is called tempering. Right? So, usually when you temper the specimen, the strengths tend to decrease because tempering is performed around five, uh, 400 or 500 degrees Celsius for uh, one or two hours. It depends on the purpose, final, uh, final property you want to obtain. But anyway, you heat up the specimen. So it is natural to expect the decrease of the strength. But Sometimes <clears throat> the alloying element such as molybdenum tungsten is inside of the uh, alloy. Sometimes you can observe the increase of the hardness during the tempering, which is called the secondary hardening. Those kind of increase of the hardening comes from the formation of very, very fine carbide molybdenum carbide or tungsten carbide during the process of the tempering. <coughs> so you can understand that uh, why we put the carbide forming element to the alloy that one purpose is to increase the strength. The other thing is that the other thing is called austenite conditioning. When you heat up the specimen to hot roll the plate, it will be about over than 1200 degrees Celsius. And then when cool down the specimen, and then you apply hot rolling, and then cool to final form, into final form. When the alloy, when the steel do not have those kind of precipitation, such as titanium carbide, niobium carbide, or vanadium carbide, as soon as you hot roll the specimen, hot roll the plate, the recrystallization occurs. What is the recrystallization? When you deform the specimen, it is elongated shape. But when you heat up it, new dislocation free grains nucleated to replace the deformed grain. So that is called recrystallization. So when you deform the material at higher temperatures, the recrystallization occurs during the deformation or just after the deformation. So at higher temperatures, hot rolling, it is very likely, the recrystallization is very likely to occur. So when the recrystallization occurs, the grain size become coarse. At first it is small, but as time elapses, it grows. <coughs> so that is why without those kind of precipitation, when you have the final plate, then you have to reheat again, <coughs> which is called normalization to obtain or to uniform, to obtain the uniform grain size. But when you put some small amount of titanium or niobium, it drastically increase the recrystallization stop temperature, which means, for example, without those kind of alloying element, usually the recrystallization, recrystallization occur around seven. 0.500 degrees Celsius. But when you increase those kind of niobium or titanium, 
the recrystallization does not occur even in 1,000 degrees Celsius. So the grain still exists in elongated shape. When you put niobium or titanium or vanadium. So when you cool down the, this kind of elongated austenite grain, then the final microstructure of ferrite is very, very fine because there are many, lots of nucleation sites for the ferrite. So compare with this <coughs> steel without diagram or carbide, you do not need to do additional heat treatment. So that is called austenite conditioning using carbide forming element. So it is also called microalloyed steel because that the amount of alloy element like titanium or niobium is very small. It's about 0.03 percent around. Any question? Uh, when after after rolling, the rain will be uh, elongated, will be elongated, and uh, so when we uh, load our temperatures, the rain will remain. I mean, the side no, the, the the rain does it that uh, will vary or <laughs> sorry. I mean. Uh, mm. The shape of the rain, mm -hmm. it will change after low temperature, after we uh, will slow down, we um, decrease the temperature, right? uh, the rain of the side of the rain. Because after the rolling, mm -hmm. we have uh, in, long, in long rain. Elongated grain. Yeah, elongated mm -hmm. rain, mm -hmm. and so we can, after that, we uh, decrease the temperature, mm -hmm. cooling. Mm -hmm. And we receive the final set, the final rain set. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, the rain side does it change through the the process? Or is this uh, remain the rain side? You have to remember that the uh, ferrite nucleate in grain boundary of austenite. Then this grain and this grain is perfectly different one. Okay, this is austenite and this is ferrite. And one of the interesting application of those kind of uh, carbide forming element is called solute scavenging. Solute scavenging is very important concept in IF steel, which requires very good formability. For example, to make a steel can, to make a steel can like this one, it is called a deep drawing, and those kind of formability is very important to obtain the sound part of uh, component. To avoid the failure during deep drawing, what is important? What might be important? R value. R value important. R value means It is a referred value, but the physical meaning of R value, you have to rem um, understand the physical meaning of R value. When the, <clears throat> the formability is good when R value is high, the uh, average R value is one, and if the R value of the sheet material is larger than one, it, we can presume it has a good formability. But why? The R value increase when 
the this is sheet when some grain has one 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 plane parallel to the plane normal when many grains has its one 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 plane parallel to the plane normal then its r value is increased then why one 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 plane is important just look at the procedure of deep drawing for preventing the failure during deep drawing, you have to suppress the thinning, thinning of the sheet during deep drawing. Right? Most of the failure during deep drawing occur by thinning. And one 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 direction of BCC ion is most strong direction in terms of Young's modulus. So when one 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 direction is plain normal direction of the sheet, then it can resist it can more it has more resistance against thinning during the deep drawing process that's why 111 plane parallel to the the rolling plane is important and people knows that the fraction of one 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 plane increase with decrease of the solute carbon or nitrogen concentration. But it is very difficult to decrease carbon and nitrogen by steel making process. Usually, the pig iron, which is uh, produced in a uh, blast furnace, the carbon concentration is over than one weight percent. Pig iron, the, the, the iron produced in the blast furnace, the carbon concentration is more than one percent. So during the steel making process, they blow oxygen into the melt iron to reduce, to burn out the carbon inside of the melt. That is one of the important way to reduce the carbon content. But there will be a limitation. So typical range of carbon, in, if, even, though you, you, if, even though you use the laboratory uh, vacuum induction melting, the level of the carbon is about 20 or 30 ppm. It's quite large according to this plot. So to reduce the concentration of the solute carbon or nitrogen, you, put, you can put titanium or niobium to fix the carbon or nitrogen as a compound. That is the concept of IF steel, interstitial free. Interstitial means carbon or nitrogen, free carbon or nitrogen in the solute state. So here free means there is no interstitials, not no charge, okay? So that is another application of the carbide forming element in 
to make a uh, steel product. Usually, the texture of the material can be controlled by the cold rolling and annealing. So, the intensity of one on one plane depend not only depends on the uh, concentration of solute, but also depends on the reduction of the cold rolling and uh, uh, annealing temperatures. Okay. <clears throat> but the most important effect of the alloying element I'd like to emphasize on this class is its effect on the transformation kinetics. As I told you, the alloying element tend to Enrich into austenite or ferrite according to its tendency to stabilize, which pays. So those kind of redistribution behavior of alloy element naturally affect the growth or decomposition of the pays like austenite and ferrite. Here, the Transformation start temperature, uh, start time, represented by the TTT diagram. Here, A is start temperature, uh, start time for the iron carbon binary alloy. When we put some amount of mangan or, or molybdenum, the starting time for the growth is drastically retarded. So, this is a typical example of the effect of alloying element on the gross behavior or transformation effect of uh, alloying element of the on the transformation kinetics. Then let's start with the simple case. The gross of the ferrite nucleated on the the austenite grain boundary in iron carbon binary alloy. Usually the aspect ratio, which means the ratio between the length and thickness of the ferrite nucleated grows along the austenite grain boundary is about five to 10, which means it is quite long in this direction. So we can effectively presume that this, the growth of this ferrite as a growth of plate, the thickening of the plate. So how we can handle, how we can evaluate the growth rate of this ferrite? It starts from the equilibrium phase diagram. When you look at this phase diagram, here, this is the, our initial composition, C bar. And just uh, let's consider, at first, the sample is here. Then we cool down to temperature T. Then ferrite is nucleate and start to grow. From this phase diagram, you can understand that the interface composition, the interface composition of ferrite size is given by this position, right? And interface composition in austenite size side is here, right? So for the growth of the ferrite, the carbon should be rejected from ferrite and should be accommodated into austenite.
So you can imagine that the concentration profile of carbon is like this one. Here is our initial composition, and this is the composition in arsenide side, and this is the composition in ferrite side. So when you evaluate the flux of the carbon and the movement of this boundary, we can estimate the growth rate of ferrite nucleated in the arsenide grain boundary. Okay? Before we move to quantitative evaluation of the growth rate in binary system, I'd like to mention about the, the meaning behind of those kind of uh, treatment. Usually when we evaluate the growth rate, we assume local equilibrium. Local equilibrium means that the concentration at the interface given by the equilibrium page diagram, page boundary of the equilibrium page boundary. The hidden meaning of that kind of assumption is that there is no free energy dissipate, free energy dissipation when atom across this alpha gamma boundary. Because we assume the equilibrium state between alpha, ferrite, and austenite there is no difference in chemical potential of across this boundary because there is no difference in chemical potential. The carbon atom will not feel any difficulty when it across the boundary. But that is an ideal case. Usually when atom across the boundary, it needs some driving force. So in other words, that assumption of local equilibrium is very good assumption, but it is a kind of ideal case, but close to the reality in some case. So, how will be the interface concentration changes change it when there is a necessity for the driving force for atom two across the interface? Here we assume the growth of alpha into beta matrix. Here, the free energy curve of beta, and this is free energy curve of alpha. In equilibrium, local, local equilibrium, we can evaluate the interface composition by constructing this tie line. Right? So this and this will give you the interface composition here and here. When there is no need for additional driving force, for atom to cross the interface. So now the situation is changed. Now we need a driving force, additional free energy to migrate the atom from beta to alpha phase. So how can you handle 
this situation. You have to give some chemical potential increase of B atom in beta. For doing that, the interface composition of beta should be moved to this position. By doing this, the chemical composition, uh, chemical, chemical potential of B atom in beta phase located here, and now we can use this amount of difference to drive B atom move from beta phase to alpha phase across the interface. So at first our <coughs> alloying element, the free energy of alloy, alloy is located here and it moves to this position by precipitation of alpha. So this is the total driving force for the reaction. And when we assume local equilibrium, then all of the driving force is used by the diffusion process. But when there is a net there is a necessity for the interface reaction, which means there is a necessity for the driving force for atom to across the interface. Now, this amount of driving force is used by interface reaction. Okay, so when the role of interface reaction is increased, the composition of the interface at beta will gradually increase. And when it reaches to this position, the, now the reaction is fully controlled by interface reaction. There is no driving force dissipation by diffusion. Okay? Okay, I will continue in next class. Any question? No? Okay, then see you in Thursday and don't forget to submit the homework in next time, okay?